is watching on Zoom who could not hear. Um, could you tell me if you can now hear? Our tech wizard has done something. Can you hear now? Okay, good. Does say they can. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment for those of you who are listening online because there seems to be a um, uh, a couple of issues that are being resolved, and then we'll get then we'll go back to getting going. And sorry for the ones that are um, sorry for the things that are a little bit problematic still. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I think we did need to have the. Um, uh, okay, I'll I'll continue then. Is that okay, or is uh, the passcode problem still an issue? Leon. It's a good thing I planned the short talk because this way. Uh, we won't run over even with the delay. Okay, sorry again, and thanks for your patience. Uh, those who are participating remotely, I appreciate your patience. Um, oh. oh, this is funny. Two people said they definitely were coming. They're not. <laughs> oh, okay, I don't see him on there either. All right, Leon. So I'm going to get started again. It's very funny because two people said, oh, we definitely have to attend this, and they're not. So, okay. Anyway, um, so we'll cover what normative pricing, uh, normative pricing and trading is very briefly. And then we'll go over earnings and we'll characterize its earnings is that there is a single fixed time scale. Um, and um, that's added, an additional one. And then um, we'll discuss drug announcements. And we'll find that in the case of drug announcements, there are many time scales. There are uncertain dates, there are asymmetric jumps, and there's hard to barn this. Um, often, but not always. Um, and then um, I'll discuss some strategies, and then I will give you an explicit example, but you are bound to uh, affirm that um, I am not recommending any trading, even though I will show you what I have on currently in one position. Um, realize that all trading is extremely risky. So this is not advocating that you um, uh, trade this product, um, but I will show you what I'm doing. Because uh, as I said, David asked me to talk about what I do. All right, so um, this is a, um, um, this is a uh, collection of smiles um, that I just grabbed. Um, notice they were from the 2nd of March, uh, both of them. One was Google and one was Microsoft. And these are what you learned. And, and since uh, Leon was on the phone with Emmanuel, Emmanuel has spent um, 40 years, as far as I know, teaching about the uh, volatility surface and smile. And um, the green represents um, a uh, short term. Um, uh, if I can read my um, screen, which is also small because of uh, the way this is set up, um, it, it's the March 17th, so it was like the near term. And then um, I didn't keep all of them. I, I just uh, kept some of the monthlies and the leaps because otherwise it just gets to be a jumble. But this is a snapshot, and this is typical of the way I, uh, a smile looks, a volatility smile. Um, and 
Um, if we waited a couple of days, what we'd find is that typically, right, unless there's some extreme market shocks, typically the volatility surfaces don't change that much, okay? Um, now, instead, let's talk about earnings. So as I mentioned before, uh, in the American and European markets, and as far as I know, the Japanese and uh, even the Indian markets, uh, there are um, strict requirements on corporations um, that are listed that they must present. Uh, and now it's pretty close to uniform accounting rules over the whole globe, um, what their earnings are each um, for the previous quarter. And so they do that. And as a typical rule, the stock will um, make a big jump or a small jump when the earnings are announced. And that reflects in the misguided but um, um, uh, industry dominant view of Fama that new information has been recalculated um, and now the correct price for that new information. Okay. Um, I say incorrect because we know that markets are driven open dynamical systems. They're not in equilibrium ever. And so um, to think about them in equilibrium is a, a big mistake. Um, um, but they do have steady states. And so for short time scales, you can think of them that way if you wish, with the caveat. Now, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. No, well, no, you, you get an equivalent formula. Right. Whether it's more illustrative or not is just your your um uh, perspective and what's uh, what what is um your comfort level. Um, but my point is I want to discuss time skills, and in fact. When um, people take my class, um, and uh, my class with Sasha, um, um, we emphasize time skills all the time. They're the most important thing. So at least from my perspective. So I like to talk about things from the point of view of time skills. But there's absolute equivalence. If you wrote Black Shoals with Sigma or with Tau, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, the point is though, you could, gain a new insight by looking at pricing, you know, in terms of the characteristic time scales instead of the characteristic implied volatility and so on. Okay, now, um, so Leon brought up the first bullet point and it's, it's just recapitulating what you guys all know from your classes that um, when you're pricing an option in the simplest possible way, so in other words, you're pricing it, let's say by Cox Ross or by Black Scholes. Okay, you have a single volatility. Okay, sorry, Emmanuel, we're not gonna talk about, um, but I did show the, I did show the volatility surface, but we have a single, um, we have a single uh, um, two time scales, right? The time scale that's fixed by when, just that's fixed by when expirations occur. And then the time scale that's fixed by the volatility. Okay. Now, um, in the run-up to earnings, you have an additional time scale because as a general rule, the uh, earnings date will not fall on an expiration. So since the earnings date is separate, it's introducing a new time scale. And that time scale is fixed by the difference between when earnings are announced and what time it is now. Okay. So, if you, if you simply calculate what that means, you realize that um, there's going to, there must be a parabolic rise of at the money implied vol into the earnings state. And that additional volatility is reflecting the move that the stock will make at earnings. So, um, what does this look like? I will show you in a second. Um, okay, so now after the announcement, the stock makes a jump to a new level. 
And the lore has it that the distribution of post-earning jumps is roughly Gaussian and symmetric. In other words, the stock could jump up, it could jump down, it could stay where it is. That rarely happens. So it's possible that there is a bimodal distribution. However, to my astonishment, even though that's the lore, I, for this talk, I went back and did a literature search. What I discovered is no one has actually done this research. And um, I thought, well, I'm, I must be sloppy. So I called my friend Jim Gatherall and Jim uh, affirmed, apparently to his knowledge, no, no one's done this. So I have a, a former student who's actually uh, runs a company in India who has expressed interest, but um, since uh, you know I'm faculty this term and I have more free time, if any of you guys want to do a project, uh, which will be to analyze the uh, movement upon earnings, uh, I'd be happy to uh, supervise this. If any of you guys need extra credit or would like to do that, and this would become a paper, I'm sure we can publish this in risk because it's relevant material. And if it has been done, it's been proprietarily secreted by one of the firms, okay? So this is actually an important project. Now, what does this statement that I made that there's parabolic increase of implied volatility to the earning state? Well, there it is. So th this is a little crude, but what this is is actually the solution to a problem set in our class where I asked the students to um, create synthetic options um, and run them. So the synthetic options are sitting right at the money always, okay? So they're a blend of options that are below and above where the stock is now. And they ran the implied vol into the earnings day. And as you can see, there's a, that's the front month, the, the, the perfect fit to a parabola, okay? And um, so this was from Microsoft. But then um, what I did was I went to um, my trading app and I started to look at Google before earnings just so I could, you know, make this thing, you know, less static. So what I've done here is I've uh, simply taken uh, two, um, two volatility surfaces, okay? Um, I've, I've blanked out all the rest um, so that you can see this clearly. So three weeks before earnings, the at the money front month volatility was 38.35 in Google. Okay. And then two weeks before earnings, it was 41 and a half. And then one week before earnings, it was 42 and three quarters. And one day before earnings, it was 48.60. And then after earnings, 32.20 at the money. So this is the rise of the um, volatility at the money into the earnings of that. And then after the event is over, there's no more movement to be captured. Doesn't matter if the stock has dropped 50% or gone up 10%, there's still no more movement to be captured. So the volatility comes in, okay? So this was, this was just an example um, of uh, how one um, sees the effect of an extra time scale on um, the volatility surface of just a normal product. Okay, now, now we'll get into more meaty um, topics. So um, drug announcements. So the first step is um, uh, discovery and development, okay? And the second step is preclinical research. Now those first two steps we'll discuss uh, almost not at all. That's where um, venture capital, okay, is involved. So if you're a VC, okay, then you'd be interested in that, but I can't contribute anything that none of this affects market pricing, typically. Um, I should point out to you that um, there's basically one class of stock that has no, for which earnings have no effect. You know what that class might be? and I'm gonna get you to interact. What class of stock do you think uh, is uh, um, opaque to uh, earnings announcements? No. I'll give you a hint, you're staring at it in this talk. 
know, small cap biotechs, not large cap. Pfizer, it's important what their earnings are, but small cap biotechs, they typically lose money from start to finish. And their price is determined by the expectation of success for their research. Okay. So just like during the internet bubble, Amazon price was trading a thousand and they had never yet turned a profit. Well, now they're maybe the most profitable company in the world. The price of biotech companies is refractory to, to earnings. It doesn't matter. They're expected to lose money every quarter. Okay. I mean, of course, it matters if they like lost three times what they were supposed to or whatever, but typically that's refractory. Okay. Step three is the clinical research. Step four is FDA drug review. Step five is the post-market safety monitoring. So what are the approval phases? How is it that um, drugs reach the market? So in phase one, you just have to show that this drug cannot be harmful to humans, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, um, obviously if you're trying to treat disease A, but you're toxic anyway, that's not, that's not good, okay. Phase two are clinical trials. So you have volunteers, okay? And um, those volunteers are taking this medication. And then there's a thorough statistical analysis of the results and um, including also measuring what the side effects are and a lot of other. Uh, in phase three trials, now, now we're on the cusp of approval if these go well. Um, so now you can expand. So instead of just volunteers, you can have I mean, instead of like narrowly um, needing um, volunteers, like people who say like, you know, this horrible disease, like I'm willing to try this. Now, now you're talking about a broader class of people and um, for which you can already provide um, a fuller understanding of possible side effects and whether it's successful. And then the FDA will make an approval decision and uh, subsequently they'll monitor it from the point of view of what I do, I'm not so concerned about the uh, post FDA approval monitoring because typically the FDA decision results in a huge move of the stock and I typically am out after that. So if three years later they say, wait a minute, there's this rare disease and there's a problem and the stock drops, I won't have a, I won't have a um, position that will be um, affected by that. Now, um, there are two fundamentally different kinds of biotech stocks. Um, uh, there are established ones, which are generally large cap. So I mentioned like Pfizer and there's Biogen and so on. And we'll see that there's a significant difference in the behavior of these. And then there are small caps, um, which have few or no currently approved products. And for these small caps, um, the movement um, with a decision or with um, a stage three or two trial result is often um, extraordinary and very exciting. Um, so let's start with the less exciting. Here's Biogen. Some of you may remember that they got approval for a drug which is not particularly great, but it's better than anything else on the market for Alzheimer's. Uh, and that approval came at 1623. Now, let me see if I can, I think, do you see my mouse moving around or not at all? No? Okay, so let me try this device. How about now? No? Hmm. Um, well, does that point? Oh, good. Well, yeah, but I don't know if anyone will see it because it's, uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that will help the people on Zoom, um, but it's strange because there is a device thing here. Uh, it says pen and laser pointer tools. So you would think, oops, I don't want to do that. All right, I'll tell you what. Oh, they can. Ah, okay, that's perfect. 
All right, so I, I will explain to you guys here, and I'm I, I'm I'm circling I'm circling with my pointer, the um um the sixth uh, of January. So for uh -huh. you guys who are here, the sixth of January is right there. When you see that, there's a big spike up, but almost all of it. So this is like maybe it's open, but this is basically. This is basically, and by the way, you, you can't necessarily catch that. Like you might get off under chairs if you're lucky or something. But but anyway, the point was that when this approval was given, the stock jumped from 271 and a half to uh, a little over 279, um, close to close. And so that's like less than a 3% move. Um, however, you can tell there was something significant going on because if you look at the lower curve, what you see is the um, the red reflects the 30-day uh, implied ball. Okay, and so you see what happened is the even though the stock wasn't doing much going in because you can see the blue curve which reflects the realized ball, but um, the vol was rising approximately para parabolically into this event. And then after the event was over, it dropped back down. But the move wasn't that extraordinary. It was $8 on a $300 stock. So um, this is typical of big caps. However, this is a product I really enjoy trading. This was Triceta. Um, this was a... Uh, this was a um, a company that the Rockefeller Foundation um, were the sole, basically, owners of. And they were trying um, to um, do something, I believe it was for kidney disease. And this was a small cap. And look what happened here. The stock was trading at $11. They failed their stage three, and it went to 60 cents. They are currently bankrupt. Their stock is out of business. The traded a penny and it's gone. Okay. So you can see that there is a huge characteristic difference between um, the behavior of a small cap with an event and a large cap. Large caps have successes, they have failures, but typically um, there's not um, enormous move in the stock uh, if it's a large cap, but there can be uh, in a small cap, it could like triple or go to zero. All right. All right. So reiterating what I said about points of entry, for investors who do deep fundamental research or who do venture cap, they can get in, you know, if they're well connected, you know, and put their money behind uh, new companies developing things. Um, but um that's not where I play because um, that requires a large amount of money, a large amount of capital and a large amount of time. So where I play are phase two and phase three decisions because I can get in like you know a month before and get out right afterwards. Um, and the phase two and phase three um, for small caps make enormous moves as I just showed you. Um, so, and FDA decisions as well. So personally, what I do is I trade around 80% in small cap binaries and the rest in large cap biotech events and non-biotech events. So I traded, um, I sent out an email uh, blast to uh, you guys, I'm talking to students now on last semester where I was pointing out like one of the plays that make perfect sense in, you know, and we discussed in our class was a play I made in uh, in, uh, in uh, um, Twitter. I don't know if you guys remember that. Or so. But there was there was a play with like completely asymmetric uh, uh, payoffs and low risk. So I was playing that. That was a, um, that was the, um, you know, an example of a non-biotech event, but mostly I trade biotechs. Okay, now, just like earnings, have a very well established um, uh, time scale. That's not the case with um, biotechs always. Okay. So, to give you an example, this is a product called Prevention Bio. Okay. And if you look at this, 
you see that it says top line data is coming out sometime in the second half, meaning between, uh, you know, between uh, end of March and end of uh, June. Okay, so no precise date. So what do you guys think will happen to the at the money implied balls? Remember that you can use a blended, um, we don't have a blackboard. I'd love to um, write a little bit here, but why don't you guys tell me, what do you think will happen? We saw with earnings that the at the money implied ball parabolically went into the earnings event, but here we don't have a specific event. So what do you think will happen? Well, uh, but I don't need it because I, but thank you. The key is, the key is I already showed you what will happen. No, can't do that. Can't do that. It, it will, it will not stay high constantly, but I'm glad you said that because there are lots of times when um, people um, think that might be the case. Um, okay, so, um, well, let me go back. Let me just step back. Okay, so what happened here? What happened to the biogen at the money? Did it did it go um, parabolically up into the event? Look at the red, right? But that event wasn't known, right? It might have. It might. They might have announced the results, right? Some other day. So what happens is actually the ball continues to rise. It, 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 and I've seen, you know, like enormous falls, but there's a very interesting thing that happens. Remember I talked about, and now guys on Google see this, but I will explain what I'm saying. So remember I talked about the fact that you have expiration. So, so the alpha money, let's say the event ends up in the year. So the alpha money implied volume is going to rise parabolically in this event. But what about the options here and here? Let's say that this event could have occurred anywhere in this region. So what happens is you get an increase of volume, and then when you get close enough, it comes back down. And this model is higher as well, but then it comes back down. So you have this beating where, um, and I'm going to show you this. So this is what you have um, to look forward to. This makes biotech trading incredibly exciting. So uncertainty, sometimes not uncertainty. You notice that here's a, a different kind of timeline. So sometimes they'll say when they'll make announcements. In this case, the FDA, okay, fixed the date for um, the priority review. Typically what happens with an FDA um, priority review, the company sometime on the day of the 22nd will get a, um, will get, um, a notice of whether they got approved or not. And then they, it's up to them to release that data. In principle, the FDA could act much in advance, but in practice, it never does. Um, sometimes there's a panel and the panel will meet on a specific day and they will make a determination. So it's not always the case that you have random dates, but sometimes you do. Okay, so um, the 30 day out the money implied ball will continue to parabolically rise. This is what we just said into the event. Um, but the individual options paint a much more complicated picture, as I pointed out, because if you get too close to expiration, you, then you don't want to hold something that's like worth 90 cents, but will be worth zero in two days. Okay. And yet, of course, the event could happen tomorrow. That's why it's still trading 90 cents, but that's a lot of premium to lose if you're holding it. Okay. Um, so what's the issue? Well, uh, what I said, the competition between the uncertain time scale set by the announcement to come and the certain expiration dates, okay? So you have a beating, you know, like, like a wave beating of, uh, of um, time scale. Um, so if there's no fixed date, 
a drug announcement can be thought of as an earnings event with a movable boundary. That's why I entitled this greens function, because you could think of integrating um, a um, stochastic differential solution for your volatility surface against the moving boundary. And that boundary, you know, is something that will um, uh, be fixed only when the event happens. Um, but in, pr in practice, supply and demand um, injects multiple time scales. So I'll give you an example. This was in a product I traded. So here's the KRTX um, event. Now, if you look at these, the, uh, these are just monthlies, okay? Um, so if you look at the vol surface for the front month in, um, in July of last year, okay, you see that it's lowest. Right, and then August August is highest, and then as you go further out, okay. And one day later, okay, now now there's this huge jump in uh, front month volatility. Okay, look at the red. Um, now what happened to the price? We we'll just moved three bucks, and it's a hundred twenty dollars stock. Okay, so it's it's not like a lot was happening in the stock, but the vol just went straight up. Okay, so let's do some analysis. Let's go to a biotech um, you know, site and see what it says. Well, what it says, and I've underlined it in red, is that their phase three top line data is expected in the third quarter, okay? Well, the third quarter starts July 1, okay? Um, but it ends, you know, August, I mean, sorry, it ends uh, September 31st, 30th, sorry, there's no 31st, sorry, uh, September 30th. So um, what happened here is that most, most people, the market, thought that it was unlikely that the event would happen in July. But not a day later, a day later, what represents this? Remember, um, no one is trading theoretically, they're trading in actual fact. So this represents an enormous increase in um, demand for premium in July. Now, um, what, was the, what, what was the amount? Uh, well, the volatility moved from 120 to 180 in July. It went up by 50%. And what does that mean in terms of cash? It means that an at the money straddle went from $28 to more than $36, okay, in one day. Okay, so someone, someone thought that the event would happen in July. Now, sometimes when this happens, and this is particularly true of um, uh, stocks that might undergo a takeover, um, there's insider trading, and you have to be very careful, and you have to work out. Um, and so, one of the things we do in the class is go through work that I showed um, about the uh, volatility surface for takeovers. Um, and there's a really um, strong way to determine that there's um, insider trading. Um, here, you don't know that, right? You just know someone thinks that there is a very good chance that this event will happen before expiration. Well, guess what? They were wrong. Okay. The event occurred uh, on the 8th of August. And if you look, okay, so I know everyone at home, but not you guys can see this red delta, okay, but, or red lambda, but you guys, you guys can see it on the graph. You see that big red lambda? Okay. So that's when the ball went from 120 to 180. Okay. Um, but but if you look at this, you'll see that there's still a parabolic rise of the at the money vol, except for this little spike that sort of interrupts it. But there's still a parabolic rise all the way until the August event. And then you see the crash in the red. Okay. So, so this is, this is um, again, the uh, effect of having these multiple time scales. This guy raised all the prices and then July expired. And so they, they, this was very helpful to me because I had already had my position on 
And what I did when the vol went way up is I bought a calendar for uh, August, July, okay? Because I could get it very cheap. I got it for like 30 cents, okay, on the 200 line. And the stock, the stock was, um, you know, trading significantly below 200, okay? But I figured, okay, the most I can lose is 30 cents if, if you know, the event happens before. But when it didn't happen, now all of a sudden I own the 200s for like 30 cents. So this was a very big, big win for me. Um, but this is typical of the kind of trading that you can look at. All right, so let's look at some example strategies. Okay, so I, I hope I've given you an idea of the fact that there are multiple time scales and they lead to very interesting events. Okay, so because of large moves and asymmetries and the uncertainty of dates and also the frequent hard to barness of um, biotech stocks, there are a wide variety of bets that can be made. So uh, one strategy is rollover betting, betting that the big move will come in the later months. So that's what I got to take advantage of when that guy like Jack would ball up. He could have been right, but I was willing to lose $30 on a calendar. So that's what I did. Um, and then it turned out that he was wrong. So now I had a cheap option in the month that things actually happened. Okay. Um, asymmetry betting. Um, so you can lean hard one way. So frequently I will make bets that will lose for me small if the stock goes in one direction and win for me big if it goes in another direction, okay? It's rare that you can have a position where you just think you're going to win. That would be if you found that the premium was ridiculously underpriced. But it's frequently the case that you think that the drug will fail with 80% you know, likelihood. So now what you do is you give up the upside, you're willing to lose a certain amount in order to have a bigger payoff on the downside. Um, now, it's almost impossible to do this kind of trading without um, uh, employing expert opinion, okay? Um, the simplest expert opinion is like what I showed you, which is a public website, you have to pay for it, but it's not that expensive. That shows you what the appropriate dates are because you definitely don't want to um, be, and you have to check that quickly and frequently. So for example, there was one um, product that just happened yesterday that was supposed to be in the first half and suddenly it was going to be in the first quarter. And, and so if you weren't paying attention, you know, or you don't pay them extra to get a ping, then you wouldn't know it. But, but even besides that, you really want to have the help of people who are um, uh, very knowledgeable about the um, likelihood of these um, drugs being good or not. Okay. Um, and then you can exploit hard to barness sometimes. So I'm going to show you the, the um, hard to barness is something we spend um, a whole section in the course on. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's when um, a stock has a small float and people want to short it, um, it becomes hard to find people to lend you the stock to short. And it becomes possible that your clearing firm will execute a buy-in against you and force you to buy stock even though you don't want to um, at, at the market. So uh, we can take advantage sometimes, of, but not very frequently of um, uh, Pricing, which is accurate according to the degree of hard to barness, um, but, um, but gives you a disparity between the physical metric and the, and the risk neutral metric. So this was the um, most um, profitable trade I ever made. If you look at the screen, you will see a trade that was already on a thousand times. Um, so let me just go over what it is because you might not see it. Um, but if you look in the left-hand column here, you'll see that there's a position of one thousand two and a half and short a thousand um, fives. So what that meant is that I had sold, okay, the um, I had sold the um, put spread, the two and a half five put spread, a thousand times. Now. Normally you try to leg into stuff, but I actually did it bid to offer. So let's look at what the bids are and the offers are. You see that the 
uh, bid for the puts was um, 255 and the offer of the call uh, puts was 44. So you could do this trade for $2.11. Now, um, some of you may find this a little strange. By the way, um, this was um, the, the date that I did this on was February. You can see that if you look carefully on the screen, you'll see a trade date of, of February 20th. And these options were for the next year of January. And this stock was around 240% hard to borrow, um, which uh, I'm not going to go into, but just like those of you who are aware of how to price hard to borrow is using um, uh, implied dividend rate, that will make sense. If not, again, it's something we're covering the course a lot. Um, so um, there's something unusual about this. Like, first of all, let me just check to make sure I haven't zoned out everyone. Um, what is the maximum value that this put spread could have? No, no, I, I'm not talking about my position. What's what's the maximum value that this put spread could have? So what is the put spread? It's um, it's uh, the two and a half five put spread. Well, it doesn't matter. What, no, I'm actually shorted, but, but forget my position. What is the maximum value and what is the minimum value that this put spread could have? Well, you guys can't get away like this. You have to tell me the answer. It's a two and a half dollar put spread. What is the maximum value it could have? Can it be worth $3? Come on, I want students to answer, Leon. You're not in class. What, what is the maximum value long one along the five put and short the two put, what is the maximum two and a half put? What's the maximum value that could take? No. Subtract two and a half from five and then tell me the answer. Two and a half. It can't be worth any more than that. If the stock goes to zero, okay, the fives will be worth five dollars, and the two and a half will be worth two and a half dollars. And if you're long the fives and short the two and a half, that put spread is worth two and a half. Okay, it's capped out. What is the least that put spread can be worth? What if the stock goes to thirty on expiration day? What are the five puts and the two and a half puts worth? If the stock is trading 30, what is the five put worth on expiration day? Pardon me? Hmm? The put, not the call. If the stock is trading at $30, is the $5 put in the money or out of the money? Out of the money, so what's its value? Zero. Okay, what's the two and a half worth? Zero. So what's the put spread worth? Okay, so you've now answered the question. The most that this put spread can be worth is two and a half. The least it can be worth is zero. Okay, so how much did I sell that put spread for? Because I sold it. You see, I'm short a thousand put spreads, but how much did I sell it for? I sold the five put for 255. I bought the two and a half put for 44 cents. So how much is that? To 11. Okay, but the most it can be worth is 250. And the stock is actually 545. Right, and so that's another thing. It's a little hard to see, but I circled it in red. So what that means is this put spreads out of the money. Now, of course, there's still 11 months to go, 
it was trading at $2.11. And the most it could be worth is $2.50. So when I sold a thousand here, the most money, I won't torture you with more questions, the most money that I could lose is $39,000, right? It's 39 cents a thousand times, right? $39,000. Remember, options are by 100. But if this went out of out of the money, right, which is where it is now, I would make two hundred and eleven thousand dollars. So I made a bet. I made a bet, okay, that I could do this for um, roughly five to one. I actually put it on. I put it on three thousand. So somewhere close to, not, not, not exactly in uh, January, but close to it, like around November of the year, they made an announcement that said the product looks good. They're going to go forward with research. And the stock went like this and stopped somewhere above two and a half. And I quickly closed this out. Okay. Now, why was it trading this high? That's another lecture. That's a lecture on hard to bargainness. But be it known that if you were to short stock against the short put spread, that you would be bought in enough times over the course of a year that it would account for the extra price of this put spread. So I just did this in the physical measure, not in the risk neutral measure. I never hedged it. Okay. So these are kinds of bets that you can make. But this is a rare one, not very often. Okay, so now let's get to, let's finish the lecture by actually going over a real example. But first, last year I played 13 biotech events. And how did I make my bets? They were based on guesses about the success or failure of the events. In, included in that were the odds of success or failure and also the endpoints for the outcomes, okay? Like in other words, um, if it were successful, how much would the company be worth? So that therefore it would jump up like 200%. If it failed, how much would it be worth? It would go to like five cents or whatever. It doesn't matter. Point is endpoints. And uh, as I mentioned, I employed expert analysis outside my personal knowledge. Okay. So I don't do this on my own. But what was my success rate? Well, just counting it, I got six right and I got seven wrong, okay? I actually got more wrong than I got right. So what does that mean? It means like, I think that the stock's gonna go up and it goes down, okay? However, my return on capital for the last two years each, 112% total, 56% each, okay? So how could that be, okay? I, I guessed wrong more often than I guessed right, but I made all this money, and the reason is that biotech trading is a lot like blackjack. The bets get scaled depend on the odds of success. So if I think stock is 80% likely to, to go up 200% and 20% to go down a certain amount, I'll make a lean. So if I'm wrong, I will lose, but if I'm right, I will make a lot more, okay? Um, so now, this is to point out to you, like I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to brag about this. I actually started doing this again two years ago. I used to do it when I was on the floor. But now, now I started doing it because of the pandemic. And I just can't stop because it's just too profitable. However, however, um, I want to point out that this is exactly in this little space that doesn't get stepped on by Goldman Sachs. Big Bang or Renaissance. Okay. They have far brighter people. They have far more capital. They have far more um, ability to enter any space they want. But this is niche enough. And Renaissance can trade in microseconds. Okay. They can trade as fast as, as they want. But as you can see here, these scales are mesoscopic, they're intermediate. They, they um, are time scales where individuals can 
you know, occupy the space without getting trampled on. Okay. All right, now I want you to know there are many ways to lose. So this was one of the more amusing ways to lose. Um, you could see that this product basically went from four to two, but we were betting that it was gonna go from four to 12. Okay, so you might imagine that I just blew it. I, we thought it was gonna be a success and it failed. And that's not the case. We thought it was gonna be a success and it was a success. So what went wrong? What went wrong was that the same day they announced their success, they diluted their stock by a factor of four, okay? They diluted their stock by a factor of four. So we had guessed almost exactly right that it would go up by a factor of four, um, but they decided to do more research and fund it by uh, their success. And if they had done this like two days later, it would have been a home run. We would have gotten out and then they could have diluted their stock all they wanted. But no, they had to announce that they were diluting it the exact same day that they announced their success. So as you can see, there are many ways to lose and to lose significant amounts of money if you're not careful. Um, and so, um, you know, this is not a field that you enter just like, oh, I'm gonna do that. You have to do a lot of um, work and you have to learn all those time scales and things. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna close with an extant example. This is something that I have on now. It's actually larger than what I'm gonna show you because there was um, a, a good opportunity the last two days to get in and in um, some more. Um, okay, so this play is based on expert analysis. It's also, you know, um, uh, other publicly available information. The expert analysis is not, there's no cheating here. There's no inside information, but the expert analysis is not something you would get just because you like, rub a crystal ball. You really have to pay for it. You have to have people who, you know, um, uh, are remunerated for this work. Okay. But anyway, we're going to discuss a product called Galera, GRTX. And this is an ongoing uh, play. So uh, just like anything else, since I'm going to show you something that hasn't happened, that I'm playing, I'm going to show you what I'm doing. However, I'm going to caution you that under no circumstances should you think about piggybacking this because you know there are lots of risks and you can lose significant amounts of money. So I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing, but um, you have that caveat. Okay. So what is the expert analysis? The expert analysis is that there will be an event on the 9th of August. Okay. This is a Padufa. So what was that? We, we mentioned that that's where the FDA gives you to go ahead or not. It's not a panel. So what that means is that indeed they could get the information earlier, but the FDA is always overworked. So it's very rare that they get the information earlier, but there's a hard date, August 9th. So by August 9th, they're either going to succeed or, or fail. So what when, when I started to play this, it was the 15th of February and the stock was at $1.66. It was small. However, it's almost a coin toss. We think it's slightly more likely to be approved um, than fail. Um, the delay is unlikely. That's important, okay? Because you, again, want the time scales to be right. And the target is four to six if successful, but under a dollar if failure. Okay, so let me just take as um, as prices five dollars if it's successful and eighty cents if it's a failure. So what that means is that the expected price is three thirty two. Now it's never going to go to the expected price. It's either going to go higher or it's going to go down. But that's the expected price. So we expect that just before the ninth of August. That's a target price, like 320 or something. Yeah, it doesn't have to happen. But let's just go and check this because again, you have to double check everything. So we go to this 
uh, and when I took the screenshot of this, it was on the 23rd. So you can see the stock was 213. Okay. Whereas when I started trading, it was $1.66. And if you look at the last entry, it says Kadufa priority review date of August 9th. So that's a fixed date. Okay. All right. So that's good. So what should you do if you think that this stock will trade near 320 by August 9th and then go either up, okay, uh, by two thirds or five or crash? by, you know, uh, two thirds to, uh, to 80 cents. What do you think you should do? Well, of course you can't know unless you look. So the first thing is I bought 10,000 shares because I wanted to be long, right? Because I thought 166 is not the place it will go to if it really is a coin flip. If it's a coin flip, I expect it to go up near 320, okay? so. We'll call that the expected price on the eighth. It doesn't have to. Uh, there could be, you know, a war in Ukraine is going on, inflation is going on, bank crises are going on. Everything affects the market. There's no guarantee of any of this. Okay, but I started buying calendars for around thirty-five cents. Um, I'll show you which ones those are. Um, but the expected move are from three twenty to five or or to eighty cents on the ninth. So the expected straddle, which is, as you know, one put and one call, um, is got to be worth around $2. That's the expected, according to our analysis, not necessarily according to the markets. So I looked at the markets, and I think that the two series that I'm going to look at, one before the 9th of August, the Junes, and one after the 9th of August, the Septembers, I think they're both mispriced, okay? So what did I decide to do, okay? What I did was I bought calendars, so I have limited risk. If the stock goes to infinity, I lose 35 cents a calendar, okay? The stock goes to zero, I lose 35 cents a calendar. But if the stock does nothing much, okay, by August 9th, I'll be out of my 10,000 shares of stock and all I'll have is a straddle, okay? So as GRTX moves up, I'm gonna pair long stock. So actually currently I have 3,500 shares, but um, the photo I took is 5,000. And I wanna be out of the stock by around $3. So that I only have straddles. And you can see what I, I mean, you can see what I've done. I basically bought a lot of September, June calendars. The way you can see that is you could see that I'm long on this graph, I'm long uh, 270 of the uh, two and a half line. It doesn't matter whether it's calls or puts, so they're all the same. So um, 270 and I'm short 270 of the Junes. And I paid 35 cents for that. So if as I expect, there's not much action before the ninth, then the price of the you know, June, the extra gamma you get from the Junes is more than compensated for by the fact that this calendar is too cheap. And to confirm that, September two and a half, um, if you look at it, you see that the straddle's 180, okay? Which is really cheap because we thought that the stock, the straddle was worth, gonna be worth around two on in August, okay? <laughs> but right now it's worth 180 and, and there's plenty of time. So I just bought a lot of these calendars. So it's a low risk. Again, I started with 10,000 shares at $1.66. I'm down to 5,000 shares by uh, 2.11. And by the time it gets to three, I hope to be flat stock and I'll just have the calendars. Um, so what is the, the bet I'm making here? No large move expected until after June. Um, from the negative gamma, oh, sorry. You could see um, here, the, you can see the uh, middle column says delta, gamma, theta, vega, and so on. The gamma is minus 4,000. So basically, by the time it gets to three, um, by the time it gets to three, the uh, 
the delta will be down to 5,000, which is basically when I'm long stock. So if I'm out of stock by three, I'll be basically flat. Okay. Um, okay. If the June straddle goes to uh, 70 cents, the June's will finance basically much of this play. So, so I'm taking advantage of um, what I think are mispricing based on time scale. Um, um, well, what can go wrong? There are always plenty. One, albeit unlikely event, would be that the FDA completes its review early and disseminates the decision, you know, two months early. But I think that's really unlikely. But there are plenty of other um, more likely uh, scenarios where something could go wrong. But if I'm lucky, what I will have is I'll have around um, 150, 200 uh, um, straddles. Um, and I'll have paid essentially 35 cents, I mean, 70 cents for the straddle, right? Um, so, um, and I think the expected move is going to be $2. So that's what I'm trying to capture, trying to capture extra move. And this is basically one of many, many things that I do. Um, I try to pick something that's still around, but is a very simple strategy, just calendars. There's a lot more complicated things I do. I, I really don't want to discuss them now, and they would only be confusing. But um, this is like a simple thing. Okay, so let me summarize. Time scales are exceedingly important. Biotech events introduce multiple time scales, which combine and beat against uh, expirations. So we've seen how um, sometimes there are enormous changes in volatilities depending on as a month comes and goes with an event not having happened yet. Um, the relatively small size of binary biotech space, okay, there aren't like a ton of these. I, like I said, I did 13 plays last year, okay makes it a unique zone where small players can operate without being squeezed out by big hedge funds. Um, expert input is usually essential. And for real trading, good risk management is also very essential, okay? You can't put on a trade that you say, oh, well, it's 90% gonna happen and like it, it doesn't happen and you end up losing your shirt. You can't do that, you have to be very careful. Um, and I, as a reminder, there are many often unexpected ways to lose, for example, the fourfold dilution that occurred exactly on the day of their success. So um, that's all. And I'll take uh, any questions people have. And do you need to uh, do something with the uh, video or we just keep talking? I have a question. Sure. Okay. Uh, these are not questions. <laughs> okay, no one had any questions from the audience. All right. Yeah, sure. No, let's go with students first. This is for the students, this part. Yeah. Right. Um. Well, well, it it was it was sort of exciting and a learning process when I started doing this like fifteen years ago, but um, twenty years ago. But it's uh, it's quite different now. Um, now you know, um, my my biggest drawdown last year was a quarter of my biggest win. Okay, so I mean. Obviously, if uh, obviously if if you know, I, when you say um, winning and losing, you see it's a complicated thing, right? So um, we'll often we'll often get the events wrong, but we'll get the the sizes right, and that makes up for a big difference. Like if we think it's seventy percent likely to go up thirty uh, percent, and thirty percent likely to go down, like you know ninety percent, okay. I have a position that's not going to, you know, lose a lot if it crashes, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so this one, this particular one that I showed you is pretty much a coin flip. We have it at 60, 40. So if it end, ends up failing, I'll call it a loss from the point of view, I mean, a, a mistake from the point of view of guesswork, but we still may make money on it because if it really does go to 80 cents or 50 cents, you know, 
um, and I and I own uh, 150 straddles at uh, for 70 cents, and now those straddles are are worth 220. That's a that's a relatively good win, right? So that's the you know that's the kind of play that I make, even though I would call that you know a misguess. Sure. Yeah, Lee. Am I um, looking at that last way you showed looking at that? Okay, let me just let me just bring it back. Um, okay, here. I'm just curious. So, are you saying like that because you have this phenomenon of the after money bond rising quickly, going into the that special day, mm -hmm. does that repricing of after money bond? Create these misalignments across strikes? No, no. Um, there, there are a couple of things. One is um, th this is just plainly, uh, if our analysis is right, and that's a big uncertainty, then then this straddle in September is just clearly mispriced. Okay, it can't be worth this little because we already think the move is going to be larger than that. However, however. Uh, it certainly can't be the case that the June June uh, straddle is worth so much um, of the price of the September one, because this event is clearly going to happen well after June expires. So what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to carry this thing till June expiry, and suddenly I'm going to go from just having calendars to having like a lot of gamma, okay, a lot of gamma, um, and. Uh, you know, I mean, there are ways this could be just wrong, like the stock could run to seven and a half tomorrow for some reason because it's a takeover, and then I'll just have lost what I paid, right? Um, you sold this thing. And well, no, 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 no. We're, we're talking about calendars here. I'm long oh, calendars. No, no, I was thinking about the one where it was. Um, the hard to borrow one? That was yeah. from a long time ago. This is very hard to find those. That one, that one. So my, my question was like, so what is the connection between finding, let's say, across the strike domain? You got misalignments of pricing. Okay, they can happen more often when you have this run up and implied. That's what I'm asking. No, you always have a run up and implied, but there can be lots of reasons for mispricing. So one reason for mispricing, okay. Well, first of all, when we say mispricing. Okay, this presumes a model which turns out to, in post hoc, turns out to be correct. So, for example, when that guy thought that the event would happen in July and he raised the at the money vol by 60 clicks, he allowed me to buy calendars August, July. So, what is the bet that I'm making there? The bet I'm making there is um, losing the entire calendar to the event happening beforehand, okay? Now I bought the 200 calendar for 30 cents. If the event, if the event happened before and it went to zero, I would lose 30 cents. If the event happened before, but it went up to, went up to 250, it actually went to 300, but let's say it went to 250, that calendar is still worth something. It's not going to be. It's not going to go to zero. Maybe it'll be worth still thirty cents or twenty cents. Okay, so so how much I could lose on it is not very much. But if the month of July expires, I now own the two hundreds outright in August. Okay, for a potential event, and in fact, the event happened in August, so it was a win-win because. Of course, if the event happened in uh, September or after August expiration, then again, that that calendar would have, you know, not been worth the whole thirty cents. But so so when you say mispricing, um, mispricing is rare that it's absolute. Okay, I have seen absolute mispricing, and as and you try to take advantage of them as fast as possible because they go away immediately. Like I've seen calendars. That have traded for zero, right? Where where I bought I bought I bought longer dated options and sold nearer options yeah. for zero. Okay, so 
So obviously that that's a mispricing, but but they're really rare. Those are true arbitrages. But the mispricing I'm talking about are versus our model. So if we think like this, this is a binary event. We think the stock will go on August 8th eat from three to five, okay, up two thirds, or from three to 80 cents, down two thirds. Okay. So we think there's going to be this kind of symmetric um, jump. They're not always symmetric, like the one I showed you with um, that product that went to 60 cents. It wouldn't have gone up 90%, but it would have gone up 50%. But so not every not everything's symmetric. But if we if we're correct about this, then these calendars are mispriced. Okay. Um, uh, September is outright too cheap, too cheap, outright. Because it's, it's, you know, it's a straddle that's trained for 170 and we think the move's gonna be too dollars, right? It's larger than the straddle. So, so you could buy it now and get movement between now, now and August and still have the straddle, right? Um, but we also think there's a relative mispricing because um, we think that, there can't be enough wiggling um, before August to uh, make up for the fact that um, uh, the Septembers are so cheap relative to the, uh, to the June. Right. So I mean, you know, this is this is again um, all that you can do. Um, but I hope that's giving you a flavor for, it. and it's also why you should take venture and finance because. Um, we do stuff that's truly practical for uh, for understanding uh, markets and seeing what look like anomalies, but which aren't, which are actually uh, functions of the time time uh, scales that were introduced. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm going to uh, stop share and I'm going to kill this. Mm -hmm.